Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Ammo sadanto suchedoye ulahudi san miao Wu Shang Shen Shen Wei Miao Fa Bai Chen Wan Jie Nan Zao Yu Wu Jin Chen Wan De Shou Chi Yuan Jie Ru Lai Zhen Shi Yi The unsurpassed, deep, profound, subtle, wonderful Dharma in a hundred thousand million eons is difficult to encounter. Now that I have come to receive and hold it within my sight and hearing, I vow to fathom the thus come one's true and actual meaning. Venerable Master and Dharma friends, welcome to our Sutra lecture tonight. This is, I need to check, it is October 6th, Saturday night here in Berkeley, California. We're looking into the Flower Garland Sutra, the Avatamsaka, and we're looking at the... uh, Ten Grounds chapter, we're on the third ground, and please join me, if you will, to uh, recite the name of the sutra and the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Namo da fang guang fu everybody joining us online um, we are now uh, we've changed our streaming so if you um, are looking for us and can't quite find where it used to be on Ustream we've changed over to YouTube streaming which people tell us this is the second week they, they tell us it's much better better image quality uh, smoother downloads smoother streaming etc so we're going to have to be working the wrinkles out of that for a while, but the uh, uh, the sutra lecture is now happening on YouTube streaming. Further, because um, our lay people are working hard and care a lot, we've now got our archives of past sutra lectures up in two places. One is on dharmaradio.org. So if you go to dharmaradio.org, you'll find an up-to-date uh, collection of our past lectures. Further, if you go to iTunes, 
you'll find us uh, as a podcast, the Berkeley Monastery Podcast. So go to iTunes and type in uh, Hung Shur or Berkeley Buddhist Monastery. Can you search by Avatamsaka? I wonder what the search, I haven't checked out whether it pops up with Avatamsaka. But if you look for Berkeley Buddhist Monastery or uh, Hung Shur, you'll find the uh, collection of podcasts, which is our sutra lectures. And, and those are available for download should you want to wait 90 minutes for the thing to, to download. Uh, our lectures are among the longest single broadcasts out there because it's a, can you find it? Is it we'll, we'll, we'll look for it. But we're getting better at it and it's, it's people's uh, hard work that is making this possible. So we certainly appreciate it. Our teacher was uh, always an early adopter of technology uh, from IBM Selectrix and reel-to-reel -reel Sony tape recorders and the very first Osborne computers and the very first laptops. Sony, or they were at the time, uh, it was a, not Hitachi, what, Yamaha, no. What was the first laptop? Uh, what was it? Toshiba. Uh, we also had a, a Tandy 100 which still works, believe it or not. I could. So we have, we're continuing that legacy by uh, making the sutra lectures available. And we started humbly. We have not done, we, we haven't conquered the world yet with our webcast, uh, the way some monks in China have also been very quick in adapting uh, technology. And certainly uh, Dharma Drum and... Uh, uh, Tsuji uh, and Fo Guang in Taiwan have their own TV stations, mind you. Much less, how much the more do they have uh, uh, webcasts? But in terms of bringing sutra lectures to your monitor and your speakers, um, we we are continuing to do that, growing uh, watcher what viewer by viewer, I guess, download by download. So. Welcome anybody's comments and suggestions for improving that. We're uh, bit by bit getting to editing with uh, titles and uh, websites on the intro page and the closing page. So we're uh, actively soliciting anybody who has talent in video editing to who'd like to volunteer to make it look a little, little less rough, a little more... Uh, user-friendly. So that's how we're doing it. Please turn in your text to page 70 and 71. 70 and 71. How's the volume in the back, David? Can you hear? Good? All right. Okay. We're on the second paragraph. Let's um, let's go out. Let's do three. We're going to do number two, number three, number four in a bunch. Okay, I'll give you a line. You give it back. Shoyo renlai yu pusa. Shunang to shen da ho ju. Wodang Yiru for Fa Bao Wan Yi Toji Wu Che Ji Cha Shi Ho Man San Chen Jie Shan Song Fan Shi Ar To Ru Wei Fa Gu Bu Wei Nan Kuang Fu Ren Jian Zhu Xiao Ku Shi 
从出发一直的佛。其间所有阿鼻苦苦，未闻法故皆能受，何况人中诸苦事。All right. Wow, it sounds really good from here. I get to hear all of you coming this way. It's very nice. All right.、Um, I've changed the text a lot, but I'll just give you. We'll just read what's on the page, and then we'll improve the English. Here we go. Can we read it together? Let's do it in unison. Ready? Here we are. Should a person come and tell the Bodhisattva? If you can hurl your body into a huge mass of fire. I shall bestow upon you the jewel of Buddha Dharma. Having heard this, he throws himself without trepidation. Should fire even fill the three thousand realms, he would cast his body from the Brahma world to enter it. In order to seek Dharma, he would not find it hard, much the less all minor sufferings in the human realm. From his first resolution up to Buddhahood, all Avicii sufferings in that length of time. In order to hear Dharma, he can undergo much the less all sufferings in the human realm. Okay, good. These are three paragraphs with one idea. That's why we read them in one gulp. This is the Bodhisattva who is.、Um, Seeking the Buddha Dharma, he or she fill in the pronoun as you choose. Wants to hear the Buddha Dharma because he knows that that's the answer to help people recover from pain. If he can learn the Buddha Dharma and teach it, he can help. He can actually make a difference. His life will not have been passed in vain. So that's what he does. He sets out to learn the Dharma, no matter what. What does it cost? Doesn't matter what it costs. He's going to learn it because he has made the decision, and that was that was the big turn. The big turn that we saw in the text was his first of all seeing how people are in pain, and then saying, "I got to do something about it. What will work? What's going to work? The Buddha Dharma will do it." And Then he goes out to learn it. So, it's a question of、uh, quest for knowledge and dedication and priorities. That's what we're hearing tonight. This is the priority for this person. Once the resolve is made, he's going to learn, no matter what. What does it say? 设有人来与苦与菩萨，孰能投胜大火炬？我当与汝佛法宝，闻一透之无切句。This this is verse, right? So it's very terse. It's not like prose where you can elaborate. So let me give you the Chinese word for word. You can see how how it works out. If somebody comes and says to the Bodhisattva. Whoever can throw their body into a big pit of fire, I will then give to you or that person the jewel, the treasure of the Buddha's teachings. Hearing that, he throws his body in fearlessly. That's that's the Chinese word for word. Okay, so what is it? Remember last week I told you what's happening here. This is the play. This is the little vignette. These these grounds, there are ten of them, follow a pattern, and somewhere in the grounds is a test for the bodhisattva, and it always follows his or her resolve. 
you decide you're going to do something, right away, kind of magically, comes this test. Are you sincere? So this is that little play. It's a little vignette. It's a skit, kind of. It's a, a um, reality check. That's what it is. Reality check. So, a bodhisattva said, I'll do anything to get the Buddha Dharma. Anything at all. No matter what, i got to learn the Buddha's teaching because if people are hurting, I'm going to help. Oh, says the universe. Really? Anything? Says the universe. <laughs> yeah, anything. Okay, says the, the universe, right? In the, in the guise of a, probably a god who comes down. And he says, okay. Here you go. I'll give you the Buddha Dharma. All you have to do is throw your body into this pit of fire. And it's yours. That's it. In other words, die. Just die. And you can get the Buddha Dharma. Die in quotes meaning any rational person. You're going to throw yourself in the pit of fire? Will you come back out? Nope. But you get the Buddha Dharma. Oh, okay. All right. Full stop. Asterisks, underlined. Kids don't try this at home. Not recommended practice. Okay? I don't want anybody throwing themselves off the Bay Bridge and going, well, the Dharma Master said I could get the Buddha. Sutra said, better yet, the Buddha Dharma, I can get it if I just, you know, or digging a big pit and filling it full of charcoal and getting some lighter and, you know, some gas dropping it. Don't interpret this literally. This is not literal, okay? This is a figurative story. This is a sketch, a skit, a, uh, a vignette, a playlet to demonstrate for the bodhisattva that he means it, okay? Now, um, it's interesting because this kind of, this device happens a lot in sutras. It happens particularly in the Prajnaparamita sutras. There's many encounters with uh, gods in particular. Sometimes it's bodhisattvas. But they're always in disguise. They're always undercover. They, you th they're not who they seem. And their purpose is entirely to test the bodhisattva. And once he passes the test, once she passes the test, poof, that it's revealed that this is in fact Guan Yin Pusa. This is in fact chakra. Come down to check it out. Check out the Bodhisattva's resolve. So there's that rescue at the end. So that's why I say don't try it at home because if we take this literally and then try to do it, that rescue may not be there and it would be a shame. <laughs> Can you see the headlines? You know, America, first American Buddhist to immolate self, purpose uncertain, you know. <laughs> motive unclear. <laughs> this person was traced to the Berkeley Buddhist monastery and, you know, that. Oh, yeah, so Buddhism's over in the 21st century, okay. We knew they were zealots. We knew they were, ex Buddhists has their extremists. You know. Buddhist cult revealed, you know. Oops. No, it's not literal. However, on the other hand, why does this show up in the Buddha Sutra if it's not real? Hmm. The, what we can find is a pattern. There's a pattern in the sutras, uh, uh, particularly the Avatamsaka, of the bodhisattva's resolve getting tested. And these, uh, particularly, there's the Ten Practices, Chapter 2, where the bodhisattva makes a resolve. In that case, it's to hold the precepts, usually, and, uh, or to follow the paramitas, to be really patient. And the test comes, and it's some extreme, outrageous, outlandish test. The bodhisattva says, I'm going to give. I want to be a donor. And living beings come and say, oh, terrific. Give me your body. I want to eat. I'm really hungry. And the bodhisattva says, oh, you're such a good Dharma protector. You've come to allow me to pass a test and enter the Dharma. Here's my leg. Here's my arm. Please eat. Eat your fill. Furthermore, anybody who eats a bite of my flesh has to bring forth the Bodhi resolve and become a Buddha. That's the bargain. Happily, he gives us, and he says, I want a big body. I want a body that fills up the universe to feed 
to satisfaction anybody who's hungry and wants a piece of my flesh to eat. So does he pass his test? He passes his test, right? He goes beyond it. And of course, that's outrageous. You know, it's an outrageous story. First of all, that these cannibal living beings come and say, you know, I want human meat to eat. And then the Bodhisattva not only doesn't like run screaming the other way, uh, or calls 911 to come arrest the savage cannibals. No, he says, ah, oh, fabulous. You're so good to me. You know, you are really my shanjushir. You're my good advisor. Here you are. And not only you, but I want to feed everybody. Not only that, I'm going to give you dharma as well. You're going to eat my flesh and I'm going to give you the Bodhi resolve. So that's the way the sutra exaggerates it. Yeah, it's an exaggeration. But it's there to, to show the bodhisattva's total commitment. Right? The bodhisattva is not the slightest bit selfish. He or she has a different set of values. But behind it is real insight and real, real knowledge that should he, she, give up their body like that, they're going to be reborn quickly with a better body and more able because less ego having given away everything they're going to be reborn quickly more able to benefit again the next time so there is knowledge behind it if you thought if the bodhisattva thought this is his or her only life would they do it mm, maybe because they're really unselfish but they have this knowledge that this is one of a succession of lives and the opportunity the chance to give in this way is so rare. You know, you could go a long time and not get the chance to give this way, to give it all up. So the Bodhisattva is genuinely grateful to living beings who come and ask for, for this kind of giving because it's a chance to create incredible uh, giving, blessings, merit, virtue, etc. So selflessness. Very interesting how this works. So understand that's the context of this. Somebody comes and says, okay, you want the Buddha Dharma? Jump in the fire pit. Got it. I'll give you the jewel of the Dharma. And having heard this, he jumps in without the slightest fear. He jumps right in. All right? So okay, so now we kind of understand what this is about. It is an exaggeration. Um, it is like violent. You know, does he burn when he jumps in? Yeah. But he's willing because this is a chance to get the knowledge that he needs to teach the Dharma, which will then in turn end the pain of these beings that he suffers with. Habuhal, dong Okay. So, second stanza, same, same idea. Let's look at the Chinese. Here we go. Ja, if fire filled 3,000 world. That's a, a way of saying the whole universe. Body from Brahma heaven and throws in. In order to seek the Dharma because does not take this as hard. How much the more human realm all minor pains not take as hard. Okay? So it's a you see the the um, grammar the way it's there's a pattern here. Um, here's how I retranslated it. I, I did it again just to put it into English that I think is more suitable. He would not find it hard to cast his body in from the Brahma realm in order to seek the Dharma. How much more could he endure the lesser troubles in the human realm? So that's, that's what I get from that. Okay, same idea, if 
Now, we heard first about a, a fire pit. That was the test that he got from the, from the person, the undercover uh, good advisor. Now it's expanded. It's even bigger. If fire filled up the whole universe, the San Qian Jie here talking about the, the threefold world system, which is a way of counting smaller, medium, and large world systems. It's a kind of a Buddhist cosmology meter, metric. And if fire filled it up, fire filled it, so imagine the whole universe full of fire. And the Bodhisattva now is standing in the heavens. The Fan Shi is talking about the Brahma realm. And if this were Shifu, if Master Hua, sometimes he would take this opportunity to rehearse the, the structure of the heavens. He, he did that a lot because it, it's, it's a standard lecturing technique. The, um, the system behind our teacher's lectures is a very old one. And once you hear about that, the, uh, it makes sense. A lot of, a lot of Shurfu's, um, well, let me, that doesn't sound right. Shurfu's uh, style of lecturing was very innovative from the Chinese perspective. At the same time, it was traditional because he was thoroughly taught in the Tiantai Jiao Guan, the, the teachings of the Tiantai school, and also the Xianshou schools. Uh, the, there were two kinds of explanations in what's called the Jiao Zong, in the, the academic side of the Buddha Dharma, in the, the Sutra school, right? The Sutra school in Buddhism, pretty much divided into those two, was the Tiantai, which is like the heavenly vista, or the, heaven, the platform of heaven school, and the Shensho, the worthy leader school. The Tiantai school focused on the Lotus Sutra, um, because Master Zhi Yi, Zhirja uh, Dashi, the great Master Zhirja, he took the Lotus Sutra as his focus. And I've been to his monastery in China, uh, where the Tiantai school, Tiantai Shan, Tiantai school was largely created. Very much a feeling there of something very special. He looked at the Lotus Sutra and then pulled out of it a series of mm, kind of yardsticks, ways to look at the whole body of the Buddha's teaching and make sense out of it. It's called the, uh, the teachings and contemplations of the Tiantai school, Tiantai Jiao Guan. From that time, most scholars, most Buddhist scholars, when they would look at a sutra, would use that way of organizing their lectures. So you could get something consistent out of it. Otherwise, it's just too much, too much information. If you start over every time you open a new sutra, you're lost. So the Tiantai school's teachings became kind of the standard ever since the Tang Dynasty, ever since the 7th century and on. However, it's not the only one. There was also a school of approach based on the Avatamsaka, based on our sutra, called the Shensho, the Worthy Leader School. And that took the Avatamsaka sutra as the standard, not the Lotus, and analyzed all the teachings from from that perspective. And it's pretty much the same. Scholars love to argue what was better, which was worse. But by and large, the intent is the same, which is to take that huge body of, of texts, which includes some 1,300 sutras that the Buddha explained, and give a consistent measure. So you could actually know north, south, east, west, and north would be north, south would be south, etc. So the Tiantai and the Shensho were the kind of the, the breakdown of what was known as the Jiao Zong, the teaching school. Master Xuanhua, Shifu, was completely thoroughly versed in all of those. He, was, uh, he mastered that. And you can see it. There are, there's a certain number of mm, techniques that arise certain number of kind of standard ways to explain this that pop up in throughout Shurfu's lectures. One of those 
was the map of the heavens. One of those teachings. So, why am I telling you all this? If you look right in the middle of the page, the third, st- the third verse, third character in the second set. So from the left, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Fan shi. That's the Brahma realm. The Brahma realm. And when we get to the, the Brahma realm, Master Shrenhua would go, ah, he would go, all right. And then he would start explaining how there are six heavens in the desire realm. That's the first realm. When you get to the Brahma realm, there's 28. When you get to the formless realm, there are four. And then sometimes, depending on the situation, he would go and identify them all and and maybe tell a story about the Brahma realm or the formless realm. And he really wanted us to be exposed to and versed in the traditional ways of explaining, but he didn't stop with those. There are some teachers who just want you to repeat those and, and absorb it and spit them back on demand, and that, that's, this is knowledge. Um, it's, it's worth repeating because it's the, it's the background to the, the Buddha's wisdom. It's the rebar and the cement that holds the sutras together. Um, but Master Hua said, yeah, you have to know this, be able to recognize it and do it accurately. But understand that all of these arise from the purified mind. Not a bit of this is outside of a single thought of your mind when it's pure and still. So understand the framework, but more importantly, pull it back from the books, pull it back from the sutras, and go investigate. If you can enter the dhyanas, if you can enter the first, second, and third, and fourth dhyana, this will be your reality. You won't have to look at the sutra. You just open your eyes and you'll see this is true. So he gave us both the theory and the practice of these teachings. So what is the Brahma realm? The Fan Shi. The Brahma realm is where the Brahma gods live. It's also called the form realm. And the gods who live there have very wonderful lives, full of blessings. This is a real place. Now, what would it be like? It would be something like living in Los Angeles and talking about San Francisco. That's a pretty apt analogy. Now, if you live in L.A., you might be unhappy with that analogy, but never mind. We have better baseball. We have better coffee, you know, we have things like that. So we have better redwood trees. They don't have any redwood trees in L.A. <laughs> What's that? Better Dharma. No, I don't want to fight. I think about that. That's not a fact. No, Redwoods is a fact. The better Dharma, that's opinion. So I can't, I won't endorse that one. But you come from L.A., so you actually know. That's okay. Well, we can say, we can quote you in the blurb. Former L.A. resident says, right? Better Dharma. And then by that logic, Seattle would be better still, right? Uh Uh-oh, now we're in trouble. So the Brahma realm is a place where the gods are always in the dhyanas. They're always in that state of zheng ding zheng shou, right? Dhyana samadhi. They're in the, he, the what are called the si chan tian, the four dhyana heavens. So it's like being, I mean, they are in the heavens, but their bodies are very pure. Shifu would go on and explain about the Brahma realm. They, they can travel in their palaces. They live in these God's palaces, and the palaces are jet propelled. You know, the palaces have uh, this ability to fly wherever they want, powered by thought. And they can show up in their palace and watch the hardly strictly bluegrass festival from a perfect seat right above the stage. And, and you know, and they've got probably the latest iPhone without standing in line. You know, it's good to be a god. You've got lots of perks. So imagine what you save on airplane tickets if you're a Brahma god. So, and no waiting in line. You don't have to get inspected. So 
course I'm kidding. But there are, they say that the blessings of the Brahma heaven gods are quite marvelous. And because they are in this heavenly realm, their desires are very few. Very few. Um, this is one of the most interesting facts. Somebody ought to write a book about the Buddha's description of the heavens because they're fascinating. There's so much information about the heavenly realm, about the God's realm, the celestial realm that you pull out of the sutras. A lot of it comes from the Avatamsaka. But one of the facts that I always was fascinated is right inside the Brahma realm, inside the, the form realm, synonymous, Brahma realm, form realm, same thing. There are five heavens where arhats go to live while their final births and deaths are being negotiated. It's called the Wu Bu Huan Tian, the five realms that you don't come back from, the five realms of no further return. So it's a very interesting place. If you are a, an arhat, all right, there are four stages of arhatship, and in each stage of arhatship, you have a different number of lives remaining, okay? So until you get into the fourth stage of arhatship, which is just before Buddhahood. And while you are still alive in another realm and have you're counting down your last lives, seven lives to go, one lives to go, a non-returner and a full arhat, while you're still in this diminishing debts to be repaid, you live in the Wu Bu Huan Tian, the heavens of the form realm. So right within the form realm is the neighborhood of the arhats cultivating towards Buddhahood at the very end of the line. How interesting, right? So these arhats live in, live in this realm. It's pure. There's no desire. How comfortable would it be to be completely in the world and totally immune to any thought that you'd be more complete if you got that purse, that bag. You'd be better off if you got a new car. You would be happier with a different phone, right? With a faster, go from 3G to 4G. You know, who, if, if you were totally immune, you thought, no, I'm fine. You know, thank you. That's good. If you, the, they say that in that realm, it, it's, you feel so uh, so free of any external uh, complaint that what happens? You think of food and you're full. You think of clothes and you're warm. Right? There's no desire left. Because your physical body's needs are completely satisfied. Now, how much misery, how much mischief is done from our bodies never being satisfied? And you go, most of the misery, most of the misery in the world comes from the body's appetites. And, of course, you have, there's need and there's greed. Like, we need to eat. Or your stomach just goes crazy, saying, I'm hungry already, feed me. I'm thirsty. The thirst is harder, comes sooner. You can go without food, you can't go without water. So that's a lot of the trouble in the world, that line between need and greed. And when it gets really intense, the greed turns to desire, and then there's killing, stealing, lusting, lying, and intoxicating which creates karma, which then comes back on the body and makes us hurt in exact measure to the hurt that we caused. So here they are, here are the gods in the Brahma heaven, completely free of all of that sensation in the body that says, I need, I want, give me, that then pushes you out into the world around you. 
how nice to be able to go through a day feeling completely satisfied, contented, happy, full, free of any need from the world. So that's one of the, the uh, results of what chanding, dhyana samadhi. You are independent. Really independent. Now, if you can imagine what that state would be like, once you're in that state of, it's, they say it's extremely blissful. The dhyanas. You feel better than you've ever felt. I mean, it's not that you're, when I say independent of desire, it's not that you're a piece of wood, cold, heartless, kind of, block of ice not it's that you feel so good there is you don't want to move you don't you don't you can't imagine there being anything else to get you're full right when you're full and you look at delicious food do you, do you crave it usually not no I'm full thanks you know pass it back so imagine being in that state what's so interesting is there is a next step, which is what? The thought, could I give this to someone else? The next step is not, I'm happy and full so I die. In, in the Abhatamsaka, now depending, this is not always true. Some people say, I'm happy, I'm full, I'm going to Palm Desert and that's it, I'm out of here. You know, Done. Many people say, oh, I'm full, I'm happy, but you know what? I'm not alone. Other people are miserable and suffering. I want to find a way to get everybody full and happy. So that next step is a wish to share. That's so interesting. Connie. Can't, can't hear... Okay, see if I heard it correctly. My old ears are suffering. Dharma Master Chur is convinced that I need hearing aids, she thinks. Right? What? But maybe I do. I don't know. She's put that doubt in my mind. <sighs> not Zidzai, not independent, needy. Right? So I think Connie said, um, what would the Bodhisattva, what, let's say Bodhisattva, so what would the person who is in that Brahma realm do as they are full and decide that they want then to help others, do they have to go through, do they go back to the start? Is that kind of the question? Okay, do they lose the dhyana feeling when they go down? Now, I have to give you a theoretical answer because it ain't me, right? I don't know from experience. But what I understand is that you don't. You don't lose that dhyana and that, that dhyana feeling. For example, I would give you Urstor Bodhisattva, right? Urstor Bodhisattva is able to live in the hells and like asbestos, doesn't burn up. Why? Because Urstor Bodhisattva is said to be a 10th stage Bodhisattva. So here's somebody in the fourth dhyana in the Brahma realm Urstor Bodhisattvas, way beyond. He's in the tenth, tenth ground. He's a Bodhisattva from the tenth ground. So that is to say, his skill, his Kung Fu, his Samadhi is even higher, more solid, more pure than a four stage Arhat about to become a, you know, a Buddha. So um, Urstor Bodhisattva, as I get it from the sutras, is able to be right in the flames and not burn up. His Samadhi passes the test. He doesn't change. So your question is, if somebody was had that level of samadhi, and let's just use that word, right? He's like able to be right in the middle of suffering and not, number one, not collapse. 
you know, not just melt because it's so painful. And two, not be tempted out to try it. You know, can you go through C's candy shop and like not want some of the caramels and let's try those cherries and the, you know, chocolate cherries. And it's hard when you see good stuff to not want it. The Bodhisattva here can s keep that wonderful good feeling and yet at the same time function very well to help people um, as I understand it. So I think, yeah, you don't like lose it in order to go help. Now, that being said, what I hear is um, people would ask Shurfu. They would say, okay, we hear the story of the Bodhisattva who would be willing to throw his body down in a pit of fire in order to help others. You know, right here, here's the sutra. Um, does it hurt to do that when you burn, you know, in the fire? Does he not burn? Um, and Shurfu would say, yeah, it hurts. But he's willing to do it. The question is, how does that phrase, there's a really good sound bite. It says, pain is inevitable, inescapable. Suffering is optional. Okay, the bodhisattva is willing to lose his body in the fire and it doesn't, he doesn't suffer as a result. Why? Because his resolve, his intention is to go through that in order to get the Buddha Dharma. There's somebody there who says, I will give you this treasure if you'll do this. Will you die for it? In other words, the question here is, what are you willing to let go of in order to get the Dharma? That's the question. The Bodhisattva says everything. Then the, the, guy, the person throws off his disguise and it's Guan Yin. Good job. Here it is. Here's the Dharma. So the Bodhisattva who, and I answer theoretically, who's in the Brahma realm, Indiana, you know, if he, Fa Putishin, you know, makes the Bodhi resolve and says, I'm going to go help these beings, he will go through death and rebirth, death and rebirth. But at this point, he's doing it because of his vows, not because of his karma. It's not that he dies so he because he has to pay back a debt for killing somebody. It's that he dies because he's got in mind the rescuing of living beings. That's his his new purpose. And that changes everything to be able to have that in your heart. So does that make sense? Is that the question you asked? Did I answer what do they say? Daswa Fei Wen, answering what you didn't ask, right? A new question. Okay. As long as you say it loudly, I'll probably take a crack at it. Okay, good question. So Connie's question is, how does the Bodhisattva do it? Um, she will have a selfless thought, and then when she looks at it again, she realizes there's a selfish motive down in the, in the heart of it. Is that... You try to... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The heart isn't there. Yeah. Okay. Well, number one, um, the the practice of checking out your motive is a good practice. That's a good practice. So the, your, the, your method is correct. And if you can be really, if you can be honest with yourself, often the answer will be, no, it's still selfish. You know. Now, what do you, how do you react to that? Do you like then slap yourself and say, bad bodhisattva, you know? That's not so helpful, you know. What you can do is say, okay, not pure yet. You know, still working on it. And this bodhisattva is not there yet. Right? There's a third ground bodhisattva. Not, earth door is already above this one. So, 
it's always going to be more or less selfish until we get to Buddhahood. So you say, okay, the selfish part, I'll keep an eye on it. The selfless part, I'll go ahead and do what I can. All right? How do you know? Dun, dun, dun. Master Shrenhua gave us these six guidelines precisely for that, right? And let me say, it's not always the case that your motives are selfish. Sometimes they're right on, you know, and it's important to know the difference. What are the six guidelines? He said, check out your motive before you do something. Now, this is not just like before you reach for a glass of milk or, a, you know, a glass of tea, a cup of tea. It's not all the time. But if you say, uh, why do I feel like throwing my body into a pit of fire? You know, why do I feel like giving up my vow and going for a Big Mac? You know, and so those are the things. Uh, where you're about to break a pra break a precept, so that's this is where you go. Okay, uh, there you go. Why am I about to call the class secretary and pass on gossip that I heard about so and so? Ding 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 ding. Six guidelines. You go. Okay, is that motive? Does it have fighting in it? Am I hoping to put somebody down by doing that? Ding. Selfish motive. Reject weight on it. Recycle that. Two, is there greed in it? Is my purpose in doing this to get rich when I know I shouldn't? It's not mine, but I want to do it. Ding, 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 ding. Compost that thought. Right? Wait on that one. Don't, don't jump on it. Three, is my purpose in doing this thing full of seeking? It's like, what I have isn't what I want. I want something different. Ding, 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 ding. You know, seeking, seeking. It's going to result in pulling me out into desire. Wait on it. Wait on that thought. So it's, you know what I'm saying. These six guidelines are completely there to do just what you outlined, which is check your motive. It, and sometimes as you go through fighting, greed, seeking, selfishness, exclusive benefit for me and dishonesty, you're going to find that your motive doesn't have any of those. Not greedy, not fighting, not seeking. And then what do you do? Go for it. You know, go for it. Because sometimes your motives are right on. And it's not the case that those six guidelines are there to stop you from doing anything. No. It's a way to check to see, as you said, how do you know when your motive is more or less selfish. The answer is you compare. You get in there and work it out. And according to our teacher, that's called cultivation. That's what he called shushi, was the, the act of investigating your motive according to those six guidelines. Now, why those six? Well, originally there were five, mind you. They, one was added later. But those six are... The precepts taken to the realm of motive before they go into action. If you can check your mind and say, yeah, that's full of fighting. I really do want to slap that person down and get ahead of them. Carry that forward and you can kill. Stop it on the thought, the seed thought realm and that no killing precept holds itself. Effortlessly. Okay, and the others correlate. Catch the thought of greed, you don't steal. Catch the thought of seeking and uproot it, put it back on the compost heap, and you don't cheat in your vows, your, your wife, your husband, your partner. Three, four, if you can catch that thought of selfishness, you don't go out and lie, covering yourself. Right? No, no. I'll tell the truth, it's painful. Yeah, okay, so you don't lie. You've kept that precept because you caught the selfish thought that wanted to hide itself. Self-benefit, want to get high myself. I'm not happy with my state, I want to get high. So you <laughs> toke a joint, take a drink, change your state. Drop a pill, whatever you do. So... Those are the five. Lying was number six because it's the one that's easiest to break. 
So that's, you know, I'm giving you a long answer, but what you described was the process, checking your motive. What do you check it against? Killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, lies, and intoxicants on the seed level. Fighting, greed, seeking, selfishness, benefit, dishonesty. When you check it out and you go, no, it's not. That was really a selfless thought. I really want to do that from the depths of my heart. I mean it. You go, do that. That's bodhisattva action. So what I'm trying to do is pull the six guidelines away from the idea that they're always bad. That you always stop your action because it's going to be selfish. No, not for sure. And the more you do it that way, the less selfish it becomes. Right? That you get better and better at it because you practice. You get six guidelines muscles in your psyche, in your goodness, in your heart. Okay? Good question. So, should... Let's see. He would not find it hard to cast his body in from the Brahma world in order to seek Dharma. How much more could he endure the lesser pains in the human realm? All right. How do we use this extreme, exaggerated example of the Bodhisattva throwing his body into a pit of fire from the heavens as far as, as high as he can be? In other words, he's going to, yahoo, you know. How do you do it? You go, okay, that's the bodhisattva's line, right? He sets the bar pretty high. How about me? Here I am down in the human realm with the lesser pains, the lesser miseries, headaches, hangnails, doubts, you know, like, I'm not sure. Should I, shouldn't I? Should I, shouldn't I? Well, the result of a doubt is you never get an action. You never do anything because you're, uh, 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 you're struggling in your mind. That's one of the ren jian zhu shao ku, one of the lesser pains here among humans. So when you hear about the bodhisattva's ability to take on like annihilation, you go, oh yeah, I can put up with this. The baby's crying and it's 3 a.m. I can put up with this. It's not such a big deal. So this gives us a little bit of a push to go through our obstacles, which are endless, right? Suffering is inevitable. Pain is inevitable. Suffering is optional. You can experience pain. You don't have to suffer from it. It's going, yeah, that's called having a body. Yeah, that's called getting old, right? So how much more could he endure the lesser pains in the human world. Okay, we move on to the third one here. Same theme, just another verse. Here's the Chinese. We're on the next to the bottom there. From first make resolve all the way to attaining Buddhahood. In between all abhi sufferings, avici. We'll talk, talk about that in a minute. In order to hear Dharma, because all can endure. How much the more humans amid all miserable things, miserable events, painful events. So what is it? From the first time the Bodhisattva thinks that he or she wants to wake up, become a Buddha, all the way to accomplishment of that to the very end of that, right? And all of the... Now, abhi is the Chinese transliteration of avici, uh, a word in Sanskrit that means endless, unintermittent, no space. A is always not, like amitabha, no limit to the light. So a here, avici, means Wu Jian, no space between. So seamless. Seamless suffering. Unending, endless suffering. So all of the endless suffering in between the time from the first resolve all the way to Buddhahood, that could be three great eons, right? Could be a very long time. For all of that time, the Bodhisattva can endure all that 
in order to hear the Buddha Dharma. How much the more all the stuff that happens while you're a human, the ordinary pains of getting up, getting dressed, going to work, coming home, going to sleep. The Bodhisattva can take all that on. Okay, same idea, right? So comparatively, the Bodhisattva will put up with the lesser pains because he, she can endure the huge pain of suffering in order to hear the Buddha Dharma. That's the key. Wei Wen Fa Gu. In order to hear the Dharma. All right? That's the idea. There are, there are great stories of the tests that happen. Fabulous stories. Um, Shurfa would sometimes uh, take the stories really long, <laughs> reiterate, and it was really the case. In the Tiantai school that I mentioned, the Tiantai Jiaoguan, right, there's a body of stories that are part of the literature. They're kind of the, the, uh, the tofu and the broccoli, the meat and the potatoes of the Tiantai's teaching are these stories great stories about so-and-so Chan Master and old Mr. Wang and Zhang Zhuo who gets enlightened and they, the stories get passed on and pretty much they're not embellished. That testifies that none of the Chan Masters of the past in the Tiantai school were Irish. Had they been Irish, the stories would be unrecognizable. They would be so exaggerated. You can't, if you're Irish, you can't resist adding vinegar and salt to a story to make it, you know, a little more tasty going down, you know. So, yeah, so that's uh, guilty. So, these great stories that Scherfer would tell, but uh, Scherfer would lengthen them sometimes. Not change them, but lengthen them. Give us the details. And one of the great stories in the past was... Um, giving up your body for half a verse of Dharma. And we all, we've heard that one, right? That's kind of one of the standard stories you get to hear. And the, uh, it's Chakra is the agent. Chakra is the masked man who appears. There's a cultivator. Let's see if I get it right. I just pulled this one out of my memory right now and I didn't rehearse it. So, Yomi Fasher, if I get some of the details wrong, you correct me, all right? So, you, you know the story. We've heard it over and over. So let's see if I get it right. Uh, there's a cultivator out in the wilderness. He's an ascetic. Maybe it's a she. Probably it's a he. Because women didn't go out by themselves. They were prey, <coughs> pounced upon. So the women would be cultivating in the monastery. The men would be out in the woods. And he is about to wake up. He's really vigorous. He's super vigorous. And so the gods are watching from above and they go, let's give him a test. Let's see if it's real. What do you think? Test him out. The book of Job. Uh, so they test him out. And Chakra comes down and says, oh, you're really vigorous. You're doing great. You're about to wake up. You could be a Buddha. I mean, you might be a Buddha already. Oh, I don't think I'm a Buddha yet. You know. Well, you know, uh, there's one thing you don't know. And if you will give up your body, I will speak the Buddha Dharma for you. I'll explain the Dharma. And the cultivator, who is in fact really sincere, says, fine. You know, what, what do you need? And he says the verse, uh, Shoot, I should have looked at my, I should have checked it out. The verse goes, to give you the details, Shurfa would string this long. It was, what's the verse? Can anybody help me out? You know, it's, um, Zhu, let's see, Zhu um, Wa Mo Zuo, Zhong Shan Feng Xing, Zi Jing Qi Yi, Shi Zhu Fo Jiao. Anybody help me? Uh oh. Turn off the cameras. Embarrassing. Uh, I should have prepared that one. That just occurred to me as I was sitting here, and I should resist those. Now, if I had used Bujang, Bhutan, Bhutio, I didn't see Bhutio. Okay, so 
the gods gives him two lines of a four-line verse. Two lines of a four-line verse. And the cultivator goes, that's, that's wonderful, that's Buddha Dharma. You know, do no evil, cultivate all good. That's the Buddha's teaching. So give me the rest of it. And the God pulls back and says, no, I don't think I will. You don't, you're not sincere. I'm really sincere. I don't think you're sincere. I'm really sincere. Well, what would you give to hear the other two? And the cultivator says, I'll give you anything. I'll give you my body. Okay, so you'll give me your body to hear the other two lines of the verse? I'll give you anything, my body. Here, you can kill me right now. I'm ready to die. And in the story, he, he does, does he step in a pit of fire? Or does he stick, use a knife? He, he's right on the point of fulfilling his part of the bargain, killing himself. And the God goes, very good. He says, wonderful. Purify your mind. This is what all Buddhists teach. Connie, you remember the story? Interesting point. You've caught the logical. Alan. He transforms as a ghost. The ghost, oh, I'll eat you. He offered, it, yeah, will you eat me? That was it. Can, can I eat you if I do it? Okay, yes, 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 that's it. His, the bargain is, uh, you can eat me, if, but not until I hear the sentence of the, the, the end of the poem. That's logically inconsistent. Okay. <laughs> wait, wait. Next week. <laughs> Next week, I'll give you the full, unvarnished, unexpurgated version of the story. <laughs> it's going to be dramatic, yeah. So, let's, let's not, let's not, uh, I, I appreciate your, your help, everybody. This is one of those basic stories from the Tiantai school that everybody has heard. Sherful lecture told this story many times. I just can't bring the details to mind at the moment. So I will give it to you unfettered, unvarnished, correctly, next time, research. So that's the, uh, it's one of those stories, okay? The test is what, what do you value more? And what are you willing to let go of? What, what is it worth? How much is the truth worth? That's the, the basic question. For the Bodhisattva, everything. He wants the truth. Right? So, when I... Now, here's... So, we'll, we'll give the story next time. What I take from this is the Bodhisattva's value system, his priorities, her priorities. What does he value? And I go, mm, what do you value? What is my value system? What are my priorities? What's worth the most? I think most people would say without question, their bodies. Other people would say family name. Believe it or not, Face. Some people value face more than anything. You can't insult my mother. Eh. Right? You cannot. You insult somebody's mother. Bang. You are. You have a fight on your hands. If you honor, if you dis, if you insult the name of the prophet, you can have a world of, on flame. A flame. Why? Very consistent with certain cultures that are called honor and shame cultures. This is a, when you, if you look into sociology, particularly the sociology of religion and anthropology, there's a whole study of what are called honor and shame cultures. If a woman, a daughter, goes out and falls in love with the wrong guy, 
she will be dishonoring the family. Let's say she, she's a Brahmin and she falls in love with an untouchable. Not to be done. Okay? The result can be she can be killed rather than shaming the name of the family. Okay? That's an honor and shame. Very consistent. There, it's particularly around the Mediterranean. Honor and shame cultures. The farther north you go, the less that is. Doesn't happen that much in Denmark. Doesn't happen that much in Finland. It's like, she wants to marry him? You know, well, you know, bring his parents. We'd like to meet the in-laws. You know, if we can live with them, don't. How funny that it has to do with the equator. Countries that are the farther south you go, and particularly the Mediterranean, think Italy, think Greece, think Sicily, think North Africa. These are places where honor is not to be violated. Violence will result if you lose face. Okay, cultures of Asia much? Face, oh boy, right? Think about it, face is... Absolutely. You bring dishonor to the Wong family clan, you're gone. That is not to be tolerated. Insults to, the, to, to honor, wow, huge. Okay, so just to say, priority, what do you value most? People would say death before dishonor. Face is more important than your life. So don't say people's lives, right? You don't insult the clan. Do not, not to be done. Interesting, right? Think about that. I, I have, you know, I wasn't raised in a, cult, in a culture where honor was more important than what law, rationality, reason was more important. Interesting. So, here the Bodhisattva says, my body, not important. If I can get the Buddha Dharma, you can have my body. Because why? There's another one right behind it. But that one will have more wisdom. Because I've heard the Buddha Dharma. Right? So the body is like, nah, it's a suit of clothes. My body is a suit of clothes. It's a hotel room. Don't like this hotel room? Check out, check in another one. There's another hotel room down the road. But the Buddha Dharma is hard to meet. You want to give me the treasure of the Dharma? You got it. Give it to me. What do you need? What do you want? My body? Whew. There's another one right behind. Right? It's definitely based on a notion of rebirth. How about that? I mean, that's challenging, isn't it? I look at myself and I think, what do I value most? Truth? I was so far from this understanding of, of reality growing up that I would happily tell a lie if it meant people would smile at me. I would pretend to be something I wasn't just to ingratiate myself to people. I was an actor. Right? Actors are not into truth. <laughs> Actors are into illusion. Right? I give you the impression that I am somebody I am not, I get applause. I, that's what I valued. Only after I met my teacher did I meet an alternative reality. That no, you know what? You tell a lie, you're never going to be able to get free. You tell a lie, your mind is not straight. Your mind is crooked. You won't even be able to see your mind because you're crooked, said my teacher to me. It's like, that hadn't occurred to me, <laughs> that there was a price to telling a lie. That hadn't occurred to me. That every lie makes a waves on the surface of the mind. You want to see through the mind? It's all distorted. The mirror of the mind was super crooked. Why? Because I had warped it every time I told somebody that I was actually from Canada, not from Toledo. I didn't want to be from Toledo. Toledo was like Midwest, a flyover state. 
But Canada was something, you know, much more interesting. You know. <laughs> oui, c'est ça. Oui. A little mysterious, perhaps, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Get real. What's real? No, oh, reality is a convention. You know, no, there is a reality, and it's in the mind. And I had been so good at twisting my mind, I didn't value the truth. Truth was something you agree on switches, changes with the wind. Said Mitt Romney. <laughs> All right, all right, all right, all right. Not going to do that. Yeah. So, yeah. And, my goodness, the Bodhisattva says, so I can hear the Buddha Dharma, I can make my mirror really true, living beings will see their reflection in it, they can wake up, because it's reliable. It's really true. The Buddha Dharma is not opinion. The Buddha Dharma is not theory. It's the nature reflected through the body, mouth, and mind of a, someone who woke up, who completely removed every filter between the Dharma and their mind. Right? How many filters does a liar have between himself, the truth, and the mind? Too many. Too many. So, how interesting, right? This Bodhisattva says, I want the truth. Only with the truth can I make a difference in people's lives. Nothing else will work. Because why? They'll see at a certain point, that's my ideas, and they won't listen to me. Right? Who has to listen to somebody who's got desire in between reality and phenomena principle and phenomena it's all twisted it's not you can't stand on it you can't build anything on a lie it's not stable so how interesting here's somebody whose values are very scary because they're uncompromising in their search for truth on the other hand scary but stable solid through the countless autumns these principles don't change. And sooner or later, we have to get back there. Sooner or later, we return to that place. The only question is, sooner or later? How, when will it be? Bodhisattva says, now, you can give me the Buddha Dharma? You, what a chance. Whoa, thank you for the opportunity. Where's that pit of fire? You know. So, the question of priorities. Now, pit of fire. For us, it would be something like, do I risk popularity by not going out with the crowd for happy hour? What does it cost me when I sit around that table and say, um, I'll have the salad, thank you, when everybody else is getting the buffalo wings and the, you know, the barbecue? Do you have any vegan options? <laughs> no. So, what does that cost you? It costs a lot. Popularity, trouble, you know. It's a lot of trouble to go around the world and try to not, and try to eat something that's not meat. It's hard. It's really hard. You have to go further. So that's a trouble in the, in the, in the mundane world. Because why we might say, I think I want to cultivate, I want to change my way of doing it, because this is less painful to the animals than this over here, which is painful to the animals, you kill them. So I'm going to eat over here. Once you say that, guess what? Test. It's not throwing your body in a pit of fire or in a barbecue pit. Could you throw yourself in this barbecue pit? <laughs> here I come. You know. Just hold the sauce. Barbecue gun. Um, it's hard to do that, but that's a test. You know, it's not your whole body. It's can I, can I live without the 
the praise and the what uh, the sense of community with people who are doing things different from my vow. That's the test. That's the challenge. And it's hard. It's really hard to not go along with the gang when the gang is going, gang is going wrong. It's hard. Right? Christmas party coming up. Right? Make those plans at the office for this year it's Hera's Club at Tahoe. Right? Last year it was the Sands in Las Vegas. Ooh. And you're still paying back <laughs> the debts and remembering the stories. True. True. We had uh, we had a couple here for years who uh, every year their practice was to reserve a suite in Reno for a week around Christmas. And they, they did it. And it w they were here for three years. And they finally admitted that that was where they were, they were heading. They disappeared one week every year around Christmas. And they, it was a family custom. And we said, did you gamble? Oh, not very much. <laughs> you know, just enough to keep your hand in. So, yeah, and it's, that's okay, you know, bit by bit you change. So, um, that's how we use this. Here's the Bodhisattva standard. This is a really high bar. Pit of fire. What is it for us? Something less. Not, not ordering what the gang orders. But sometimes that burns, you know, it burns. So, where does it burn? Well, it burns in reputation, face, popularity, Promotion. We're not promoting you to head of sales because we know that when you go out to the new clients, you're not going to be eating the ribs and we don't trust you. So we're going to promote somebody over you who eats meat because that'll bring in more sales. What do you think? Ouch. So yeah, that's, it's real, real stuff. Now, I'll, I'll, it's time to stop, but I'll uh, tell you the story of uh, Wang Dong. Some of you will know about him. He's uh, uh, Wang Jinping's older brother. Wang Jinping is the long-term speaker of the Senate, Li Fayan in Taiwan. And his older brother, Wang Zuqing, was a banker down in Kaohsiung County, and uh, he was a vegetarian. He was one of Shifu's disciples. And it had been for a long time. And uh, he had a policy of never ying chou, the standard way. Ying chou means all of the, uh, the courtesies that surround doing business deals. Traditionally in Taiwan, if you did business, and this included bank business, um, you sent cigarettes and alcohol. And even to the point where the alcohol it had to be the right kind of Suntory whiskey or Johnny Walker or, or uh, Four Roses, they were specified. And the more, the different kind you gave, the, the more honor you were giving the client. So he refused to do this. And he would never, you know, order from the meat side of the menu when he was doing ying chou. And his policy was, you want to do business with me? That's your business. I'm not going to break my rules in order to get your business. And Wang Zhuqing was famous because his bank lost a lot of deals. But after... Sticking with this, things turned around and people started to do business with him because he stuck to his principles. And I remember this, uh, this businessman coming to the monastery and he said, yeah, yeah, he said, I, I, there's a special kind of client that comes to his bank. And you know what they tell me? They tell me that all the businessmen that they deal with, they like doing business with Wang Dong 
because they know that he stands for something. They like the fact that he consistently will treat us to courtesy from his heart, but we know that because he doesn't break his principles and his, his own habits, that means he'll keep his business promises too. We prefer to do business with him, even though he's got these funny habits. We respect him more, and that's the kind of businessman we want to deal with. So I heard that and think, yeah, there you go. Now he went through a time of kind of limbo because he wouldn't send the alcohol and cigarettes along with the contract. And he, because he was willing to go through that period of different from everybody else, and he came out the other side and became valued for his integrity. So in this case, his cultivation helped the bottom line. But he had to go through that period of, well, you know, he's different. Loser, you're not going to get my business because I want the Suntory whiskey. No, I said, fine. There's a lot of banks down the street. You know, that became his, his strength after a while. But he had to go through that period. What do we value? What are we willing to let go of in order to get something else? That is the question. So can we transfer the merit? You'll find it in your songbook there or your chanting sheet on the back. Please make a wish. Compassionate and wise. 